Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you so much. I'm just so glad everybody's here. And uh, I'd like to tell you that, first of all, my name is Rena. I am an alcoholic, and I am sober by the grace of a a loving God that I did not believe in when I first came to AA. Uh, I got here on October 16th, 1975, and have been sober ever since, one day at a time. I love AA. It is, um, I'm so in awe. The longer I'm sober, I am so in awe of the construct of this amazing program that allows me to delve deeper and deeper and deeper into my most favorite subject of all, which is me. You know, there's nothing like me, 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 you know. And so how could I possibly get bored just learning a little more about me? Now, a lot of it, I got to tell you, is not flattering. A lot of it is stuff that I had not a clue. Well, actually, most of it was stuff that I did not have a clue. Who knew I was self-centered? I thought of myself as just being the most doormatty kind of person ever. You know, I just gave, gave, gave. And I was just a little martyr running around and and picking up people that I knew were going to hurt me. And uh, as I said, I had not a clue of any of this, you know. My self-awareness, even though I had been to many psychiatrists where I learned how to blame better, but I didn't get any insight at all. You know, it was just a matter of of going and telling the psychiatrist what was wrong with everybody in my life and why in the heck wouldn't they straighten up and fly right like they should. And then I'd pay them and leave. And uh, they didn't probably felt fine about it, too, because they knew that I had not a clue, not a clue. But on page 59 of our big book, it talks about what we're like, what happens, and what we're like now. And what I was like, I've kind of described, you know. I come from um, uh, a family. uh, My mother and father were both alcoholics, but they were the kind that were socially alcoholics. They blended in with all their friends. They had a lot of parties. And nobody ever got fired or, or, or hit anybody with a car or anything like that. Um, and my dad was in the military when I was a kid. So we moved all the time. I hated it. One of my first addictions was reading and I'm pretty sure I learned how to read and I did learn how to read because, uh, I wanted to have my own world. I did not like the one that was outside of me. And I'm not really sure why. I had a little sister who thought moving was the most wonderful thing. We're going to make new friends and blah, blah, blah. And I think it killed her, you know, because I'm sitting there sullen, full of self-pity, working on my martyr role. And I was six years old, you know. By the time I was six, I want you to know every character defect that I've ever had in my whole life was in full bloom. And I was 100% self-centered. It was all about me, not about anybody else in the family, you understand. And um, and we moved, and I read. I used to think that I was reading for escape, but the more I, I look back on it, the kinds of books that I chose to read were of happy, loving families that did a lot of things together. Usually they were on a farm. Now, I've never been on a farm, but I could relate to what they were doing. They all worked together and kind of the John boy kind of stuff, you know. Um, And what I was really looking for was some kind of sense of belonging, you know, some kind of of fellowship that uh, uh, where where I, I fit in because I didn't fit in. You know, I knew I didn't fit in and I knew you all were looking at me. And I knew that, that you were telling me, you know, things like, who let you in, you know? And I figured if they knew about me, they'd ask me to leave, you know? So I don't know where all that stuff came from. Nobody told me I was unlovable. I just felt that way. And I, um, 
I ended up doing a whole lot of reading about people on farms. And uh, as a result, you know, I know a lot about farming. I know very little about uh, how to do life because I didn't do it. You know, I had to go to school, so I went to school and all the rest of that stuff. But anyway, I'm telling you all that just to show you that uh, I was weird from the beginning. You know, I mean, I had every piece of alcoholism except the alcohol. And that's that's the truth. But when I think about it, too, my story is about relationships. It's the relationships that I did not have because I was scared. You know, self-centered fear was my middle name. Of course, I did not know it. But the whole concept of being so self-reliant, you know, and, and I'm in charge of my life, and if I don't do it, who will, and all that, came from back there, you know. Um, and I grew up pretty much that way. Uh, somehow I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. But let me tell you, about, I guess I better mention a little bit about drinking. Um I did not drink until I was 22 years old. I don't know if it's because I watched my parents and I really didn't want to be like them. Um, even though they were socially acceptable alcoholics, they were still alcoholics. And my, my mother was the kind of alcoholic that just withdrew and she shut down and, and didn't really interact with anybody. And my father was a shouter. He never physically hit anybody, but he shouted a lot. And I happened to, I raised my hand when they said, who wants to be the scapegoat in the family? And I was right there, you know, good old Margarina. And so he was, he would shout and he would shout at me. Now my sister was perfect. So of course nobody shouted at her. The only thing they did was tell her how great she was. I hated her, just hated her. And, uh, you know, I was terrified. There's a line in the, um, 12 and 12 in the fifth step that talks about anxious apartness and that when I read that it hit me like a ton of bricks I had felt anxiously apart my whole life of course I never talked about it to anybody because I never talked about anything to anybody I had the stiff upper lip I was self-reliant to a fault and I was always just fine thank you I never let anybody see any any chink in my armor um, basically I lived in a tank and I'd look out all the little slits in the tank and, you know, I had my little gun thing going and moving around to catch anybody who was coming after me. I really looked at the world as a very hostile place and I was extremely defensive about everything. And, uh, as I say, I have no idea where that came from. My mother wasn't like that. My father wasn't like that. And, you know, my sister wasn't like that. Um, but that's who I was. Um, at any rate, so at 22, I had a drink of alcohol because I was scared. I was on a date with a man that was older than I was. I was 22. He was 25. He was an older man. And he offered me a Manhattan. And out of sheer nervousness, I said yes. And I mean to tell you, everybody in this room knows how I felt when I had that drink. It just smoothed everything out. I mean, I felt like I belonged to the world. Everything was wonderful. And I made a decision. I'm going to stay in this world as long as I can. And I did. I gave it the good old college try. I mean, I, I really worked hard at my drinking and it became a focus, uh, above all focuses. I dropped out of college because of drinking. I started moving around a lot because of drinking. I got married a lot because of drinking. I got divorced a lot because of drinking. But nonetheless, the drinking was the main preoccupation in my mind. I had not a clue about uh, the progression of the disease. I had not a clue that women go down faster than men. I am so grateful that that's the case for me. Because uh, I would hate to be out there any not one minute longer than I had to, you know. I would hate to think that I could keep on drinking because I didn't hadn't hit bottom yet, you know. Uh, somehow that is the most absurd thing I've ever heard in my life. So at any rate, I was drinking and traveling and marrying and divorcing and and but drinking, 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 and it got down to the point where drinking um, became a, a problem and. Uh, 
I went to a doctor because I was uh, pretty much turning yellow and I didn't think that was right. So I went to see a doctor and he took one look at me and he said, Rena, you're an alcoholic. You need to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I thought, well, okay, just to get him off my back, I'll do that. I was drunk as a skunk. I went to my first meeting in 1972 in Dallas, Texas. And I went to that meeting and God knows what it was really like. I just know what I thought it was like. I thought it was all men that were 150 years old. I was in my 30s. And I thought that we were all sitting on orange crates. And I thought really that they just talked about how how bad it was they couldn't drink. They pass a basket. And I gave them a dollar and felt very superior when I left. Dead drunk. I'm sure I kept everybody in that room sober that night because I wasn't obnoxious, but I was obviously not fit for, you know, polite conversation. So I left that meeting with the same feeling I had about everything else, that you all are not like me and I am not like you. Once again, back to the isolation and the feeling of aloneness and the loneliness that I'd had my whole life. And it took three years of trying to control or stop drinking before I finally surrendered from 1972 to 1975. I was a mess. I got progressively more and more isolated. I ended up drinking around the clock. I would drink, wake up, well, come to and drink again and pass out. And I did not work. I did. I had alienated my family, so I didn't see anybody. I had no friends. But I got to tell you, I married this guy to go to the liquor store for me because I was afraid to drive. I was not afraid of getting a DUI because in those days, it weren't a big deal. But I was afraid I was going to hit somebody, and I knew I couldn't stand living with that, you know. So I married this guy to go to the liquor store. You know, the weird thing is I do not remember his name, but we were married for this long, you know, because he was my lower and lower companion. It talks about in the big book. And so me and my lower and lower companion drank. Now he didn't drink any of my scotch and I didn't drink any of his beer. So we were a perfect couple. Um, but I, one day I had this vision. I wasn't going to die like the doctor said, you know, they kept saying, Rena, you keep drinking like this, you're going to die. And I kept thinking, I don't care. I don't care. Of course, I had this vision. I was going to be nicely dressed and my hair was going to be done and the lipstick on and everything. And I was going to lie down one day and just kind of go away. And that's what I thought an alcoholic death was. Well, our stepson died of, of alcoholism three years ago. And I'll tell you what, it is not pretty. It is a horrible, horrible, painful way to die. I did not know this, you know, at the time. But I had this this vision. But I, I had the vision was that I wasn't going to die. I was going to keep on living the same way I was living that day, that minute. And I tell you what, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand it another minute. I, I just, you know, you hit a breaking point. <laughs> and I did. And I called AA. This was three years after my one and only meeting. I called AA and started going to AA. And once again, I started feeling a little better. And I hung out for about two months. I sat in the back of the room. Once again, I did things like I, I compared my outsides and my insides with you all and your outsides particularly. And I looked and I saw I am not like you. You do not feel the way I do, and I know it because you're laughing and you're talking like everything's fine, and you're just so happy to be sober. And I'll tell you what, those bedevilments got me when I was sober. I could not stand sobriety. It was the most uncomfortable thing in the world. You know, I was restless, irritable, and discontented, and uh, I just was miserable. I was scared. And I just stayed home and read. So why bother being sober, you know? And it was such a relief when during those three years when I was playing around with it, with sobriety, not AA. And I, um, 
I still remember how it felt to give in finally and take that drink after I'd been sober one day, two days, even one time. I, one time I went five months and it was God awful. Yeah, I even got a job thinking that might help, you know. And what I learned how to do with the job was to carry big purses and small bottles. And so, you know, this was not the answer, obviously. But uh, one day, for some reason, I was all by myself on October 16th. I did not know that was going to be my first day of sobriety. I did not know that my life was going to change dramatically. I just know I was sitting there absolutely comatose in my head because I had absolutely no purpose in life. And I didn't see any point in going on, but I am too self-centered to want to kill myself because I'd want to know who came to the funeral. And so, you know, not, not a chance. Besides, I didn't like pain, I told myself, and I couldn't figure out a way to kill myself that didn't involve some kind of pain. At any rate, uh, so I'm sitting there and the phone rang and the phone never rang. And the biggest part is I answered the phone. And I never answered the phone, but I answered the phone and it was a woman I did not know. She did not know me. She, uh, she and I ended up talking. I don't know how she got, we never did figure out how she got my phone number, but she called me. We ended up talking the whole day because she had six years in Alcoholics Anonymous. And here's what happened that to me is a total miracle of AA. She did not talk to me about my drinking. She talked to me about her drinking. She talked to me about what she did prior to drinking, during drinking, and what happened to get her into AA, and what had happened to her since then. And it was the most amazing thing. I had been to all these doctors and to psychiatrists, and everybody in my family had said the message was all the same. They talked about my drinking. I've got to slow down. I've got to not drink so much. I've got to stop drinking, whatever. But it was always criticism aimed at me. And this woman did not do that. She simply talked about herself. And that to me is the essence of AA. When I share me with another woman particularly, I am sharing the beauties of AA. And I don't have to say much, you know, it's just the sharing part. I had not been around anybody that shared pretty much my whole life. It had always been one of those relationships like this, you know, or it had been somebody talking down to me or somebody I was talking down to. And uh, this was the most amazing thing. At the end of that day, and God knows what I said, I'm sure I did a very thorough fifth step with her. Uh but I, I, at the end of the day, she said, Rena, you've gone 12 hours without a drink of alcohol. If you go another 12 hours, you will have spent one whole day sober. And that's how we do it in AA, one day at a time. And she said, I suggest you get on your knees and you ask God to help you to stay sober tonight. And I, with all my arrogance, said, oh, Robin, I don't believe in God. I never had been to church. My parents never talked about God or church or anything. And I would never had really much of an opinion about it. It was not an issue in my life. And uh, so I said to her, I'm just not. I'm and thinking I thought spirituality was religious. And she explained to me the difference and said, this is not a religious program. And she also said, and you know what, Rena, it's a spiritual program. And if you don't become spiritual, you lose. And I became absolutely terrified. I was afraid I was going to lose the only human being I had ever felt a connection with, any kind of a connection. And it was just an enormous event from in my life. Uh, and so out of my mouth came words that, looking back on it, were monumental. I said, maybe I'm a little bit spiritual. And that little tiny admission that my way perhaps was wrong, that I didn't have all the answers, that maybe somebody else could give me some directions because my self-reliance had obviously failed me. And that little tiny admission that I needed help 
was just huge. Not at the time. It was just, you know, okay, I'll do this because I want her to stay in my life. And so she suggested, because of my situation, she said, throw a shoe under the bed. And while you're down there getting the shoe out, say a few words. And so I made sure all the curtains were drawn and nobody was looking in the window and all this stuff. <coughs> and I threw a shoe under the bed because I'm extremely literal. And I threw a shoe under the bed and I got down on my knees and I said, Robin's God, if you're there, would you kind of keep me sober tonight? And I thank you very much. And I stood up. And you know what happened? I went to bed that night and I slept solidly for the first time in years and years and years. And I woke up the next day and I called Robin and I said, I've got 24 hours. I have a whole day. And she said, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. You are now a card-carrying member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I about wanted to cry because I just felt so blessed. This from a woman <coughs> who had gone to an AA meeting and looked so disdainfully down on everybody. <coughs> I felt so blessed that I could be a member of AA. Well, it turns out, though, this guy that I married to go to the liquor store uh, went to other places with my credit cards. And uh, Robin said, you know, I ordinarily would say you shouldn't make any major changes the first year, but that you don't have to. But I think in this case, you have to. He's got to go. For one thing, he wanted me drunk. He would, I would, I couldn't drive because I hadn't been driving for you know, a long time. And um, so he would, I would get a, a woman would pick me up and we'd go to a meeting. And uh, we, as we came out, he'd jump out of a bush. You know, he was looking to see. He thought I was at going to AA to find a replacement for him. And I'm thinking, who in the hell would go to AA and look for a man? You know, I mean, please think about it. And, uh, well, now I've had two AA husbands. Um, but um, at any rate, uh, so I, as I say, I can't remember the man's name, so it wasn't that difficult to divorce him. Um, I, it turns out I was broke because he had gone to many places and I owed a lot of money. So I ended up moving down to Fort Lauderdale from West Palm Beach, lived in Florida at the time. And uh, I ended up living with my father of all things. My mother had died some years before. My father was a roaring alcoholic by this time. And uh, he had booze all over the place. He lived in a big building in, on Fort Lauderdale Beach. And there was a tiki bar out in the, on the sand, and there was a restaurant with booze. He had booze everywhere. And you know what? I never would have suggested to anybody that they move in a place like that. But I did, and it was absolutely the right thing for me. It just shows me that I can stay sober if I want to, no matter what's going on around me, no matter how much he drank, no matter how much booze there was. I had no need to drink his alcohol. It probably made me go to a few more meetings than I might have. Although in those days, we had one meeting a day, and it was at 8.30 at night. And uh, I was at a meeting every night. But before that happened, um, I was getting into that old spiral of martyrdom and self-pity one day. He was gone, and I was just feeling so sorry for myself. What a loser I was. I, had, I was in my 30s, for pity's sake. I had nothing and and would never had anything. You know those little spirals you go into where you get way down into it, just feel, feel, feel so bad. And I was going that way, and this all of a sudden this voice came in my head and it said, what are you going to do about it today? And I had never had a voice in my head, so I stopped and I listened, and I thought, well, and I answered it. I said, I could go get in my car and find a meeting that I'm supposed to go to tonight. And that way tonight when it's dark, I can't say, well, I don't know where the meeting is and I can't go. So I did that. And here's what's happened. I went out of the condo and got in my car and immediately felt better. Immediately, I was fine. And it just shows that taking some action changes how I feel. My thoughts always were, I have to figure this out. 
and I would sit and think about something until I got an answer. Well, guess what, folks? I found out in AA I had that so backwards. I had to take the right action, and then my thoughts and feelings follow. You know, um, I I talk a lot about early sobriety because I'll tell you what, everything else is just a little refinement of exactly what happened to me in the early days. I really believe that we live on more than one level. And I used to think, you know, I'm going to a meeting because I'm going to a meeting. What really was happening was I was learning how to have a relationship with another human being. You know, superficial, because I was at a meeting, saying hi, how are you, that kind of thing. And yet, at the same time, uh, I was going to meetings and learning how to live life. Um, just amazing, you know. My sponsor was, I used to watch her, and I learned more from watching her and her behavior than I did from anything, pretty much, that she said, because she lived the program, and I wanted to do that, too. It's funny, you know, uh, at the, when I got a year in sobriety and I was celebrating all over town, I mean, I went to every meeting and got a medallion at every meeting that I'd never been to. And I, they gave cakes there. So I was bringing home cakes one night after another. And my sponsor gave me my medallion. And she said, uh, Rena to everybody. She said, Rena, you spent a year learning how to not drink you will spend the rest of your life learning how to get sober. And oh my God, another little ego deflation, you know, what the heck. But she was right, you know, because the, the, the drinking is just a symptom of what was wrong with me. You know, what was wrong with me was my self-centered, absolutely impossible stance in life that guaranteed failure. It guaranteed isolation. Um, it was, it was bad. But one of the things they asked me to do the first year was to not date. They, and here's how they put it. Nothing, they never minced words. They said, Rena, you are so sick. You would only attract a sick man. And I had to gasp because I knew she was right. I looked at my own history and I could see that she was right, that I had not a clue how to choose a man, you know, and she was right that, that some, some guy, you know, would pull out a chair for me and I'd fall in love. And it's all based on low self-esteem. I did not like myself. I did not like myself when I was six years old. You know, I felt like my sister was the one that did all the good stuff. She was a success. Not that she did that much, but her attitude. And I knew my attitude stunk. And I was, and I also knew I would go right out and choose exactly the same guy like the three I'd married before. And so I didn't. And it was the best gift I gave myself because I not only learned how to live with me, I learned how to live with you, and I learned how to live with God. And throughout that that year, it was magical. And I think for most of us, that first year is magical. We're stumbling around in the dark trying to figure out how to tie our shoes. And the most amazing things are happening, you know, inside of us. And it's the insides that are the problem for me, not the outsides, you know. And even though I would sit there and compare my insides with your outsides and find myself lacking, I was told that that was the backwards way to do it, you know, compare insides to insides and outsides to outsides. That's the only right way to do it. And by the way, don't compare at all because it's stupid. You know, all you do is get vain or bitter if you compare. And, you know, these people were right. I couldn't argue with them. I tried. I did, especially the not dating thing. I told my sponsor, hey, I just came here to get sober. And she looked at me and smiled her beautiful smile. And she said, Rena, that's what we're talking about. I had not a clue what sobriety meant, you know. So... I did what they suggested. I went to tons of meetings. I worked a lot with my sponsor. I learned how to make a friend with another woman. I had always looked at women as um, competition or stupid, but I found out that they're they're the they're the best asset I have. My friends, my women friends. And when I was two, I met a man, and in the program, and I was five, and he was nine. We got married. 
And that's when my education really began. It took two loving sponsors, two loving higher powers, and a commitment, a 100% commitment on our parts to have us survive the first couple of years of marriage. We got right back into our respective tanks and were defensive and argumentative and self-centered. And it was, it was awful. It was awful. And yet at the same time, I look back on that time as such, with such fondness because it showed that, that I was willing to go to any lengths to stay sober, that I'm a seeker, that I want the best there is in sobriety. And I'm not settling for anything. I settled for stuff my whole life. And Bill and I worked out a whole lot of stuff. I had no idea that every idea that I had came from watching my really healthy parents and deciding that that was the right way to have a relationship. Oh, no. Oh, no. I had to learn how to communicate. I didn't know. I thought communicating was talking. And I had to learn how to listen. Usually, if somebody was talking, I was formulating my answer in my head to counteract whatever it was they were saying. So I never heard what they said anyway. I had to learn how to actively listen. And they gave us this this um, exercise, our sponsors. We had to sit knee to knee, holding hands. We said the serenity prayer. We asked God to come in and be there with us. And then we could talk. We could only talk in I language. I couldn't say you make me feel. I could only say I feel. And I'll tell you, when you're sitting knee to knee with somebody, it's really hard to shout at them. And it's really hard to really make ugly, ugly remarks about them. Um, we learned how to do this. And the, the deal is that both of us were willing. I don't think if one of us hadn't been 100% committed to the relationship, we, we never would have made it. But we were. And we ended up having a fantastic relationship that grew and grew. And it's funny, we look back on the bad bad times as our best times because it's when we were growing and sharing and learning how to love each other as human beings just as we are not as I demanded he be and not as he demanded I be not as wishful thinking not as counting his his uh defects I learned how to count his assets and it's all about attitude isn't it you know as soon as I could get a positive attitude about things an attitude of gratitude and it, it changed everything for me. And Bill died when uh, we had been married about 20 years. He was playing golf with his AA buddies one day, had a massive heart attack and died. And you know what? That's when AA and the women that I sponsored and my women friends really, really saved my bacon because I could talk with them and uh, not be thinking about me. And I went through all the processes of grief. I had never done that when my, uh, actually my sister died as well when she was 13. I didn't grieve. My mother died when she was in her early 50s. I didn't grieve. I just kind of passed it off as well. Life happens. But when Bill died, I went, I decided I was going to go through whatever I needed to go through because I knew that if I didn't, I would never be free either. If I don't go through the stuff that's going on in my life, I will never be free of it. It will own me, just like that bottle did. And so about four or five years after Bill died, and I was still you know, heavy into AA, running around the conferences, having the best time, and um, doing all my stuff. And I, a man that had, I'd known for 20 years uh, in AA, and he was a widower. And we were at a meeting. I mean, up to that point, he'd been just another person. Uh, I looked at him, and he looked at me, and all of a sudden, he looked different. And, well, let's see, we've been married about 18 years now. And uh, it's it's wonderful. You know, I I know I'm about to run out of time, but uh, I want you to know that, that the journey that I've had is really the most amazing. Oh, I, I'm so in awe of AA, as I said how they put this together to take a wretch like me and to turn me into a person that loves life, that loves other people. This person that was so isolated, I found out I'm a people junkie, you know, 
COVID has been difficult for me because of not being able to get together and to, to hug people and stuff. I'm a hugger for pity sakes. I was one of those people, don't touch me, you know? And uh, when I got sober, they didn't hold hands when they said the Lord's Prayer. If they had, I probably wouldn't have been here because I couldn't stand being touched. And now, you know, I love my hugs. And Zoom, thank God, has saved us all, you know? It's not the same exactly, but there are people on this meeting that I've known from other meetings, and I feel like, oh, there's there's Daryl, and there's there's this person, and and uh, and Carol, and Cheryl, and Tally, and you know, and isn't this amazing? Not to mention Amanda, and uh, it's just so neat because I do feel like I know you all. You know, I feel like I'm a whole human being. I'm living my life, not just doing it. And it's all because I drank too much, or actually, I really think I drank just the right amount. And here I am, as happy as I can be. Uh, what can I say? My life is good. I like life on life's terms. Um, and I'm so happy to be here tonight. I probably left out a lot of stuff that I was going to talk about, but I'll tell you this, and then I'll be quiet. Um, talking about early sobriety is the most pleasant thing I can think of doing because everybody in this room can remember when they were newly sober and we talk about the blind leading the blind. You know, my new friends in AA were just as, as uh, hapless as I was. And to, to go on this journey and all of a sudden look back and see, my gosh, look how far I've come and not have to say, I know I have so far to go because I don't. I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. And thank you so much for listening. I'm so glad I was here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.